Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Daco, Chief U.S. Economist at Oxford Economics, and I'm joined today by Kathy Bostianczyk, Chief U.S. Financial Economist at Oxford Economics. So, Kathy, um, over the past few days, uh, we've seen a lot of developments at the Fed. Uh, what's the latest from the Fed in terms of monetary policy? Well, they've just cut rates, uh, another 25 basis points, which is what we expected and, and most everyone else. Um, but there wasn't a lot in uh, clear forward guidance, yep. and, and that seemed to be purposeful. Um, on one hand, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the outlook for the economy. There's uncertainty around trade policy. I also think uh, Chair Powell and, and other Fed officials have recognized that uh, maybe less communication is better mm -hmm. um, because there's a chance if you over-communicate, you miscommunicate and that could box them in, it gives them some flexibility. And, you know, I think there's division among the FOMC as well. That, you know, that's important to mention. Um, we saw, uh, and we've heard, but we saw from the dot plot estimate that some want to keep, wanted to keep rates unchanged. Yep. Uh, you know, some wanted to, to cut rates uh, and then cut another 25 basis points on top of that. Sure. So it's a pretty big divergence of opinions and views right now. So that's the biggest question uh, is what do we get going forward? I think, of course, that ties into the trade policy and you know, what's the latest going on with China. Seems like maybe a little bit of a setback on the trade front. Yeah, I think Powell put it uh, nicely. It, uh, this uh, trade thing goes up and then it goes down and maybe it's up again. <laughs> but anyways, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we've seen essentially, and if you look at the facts, we've seen a rise in tariffs between the two countries. As of September 1st, there was a, an additional tranche of tariffs at 15% on $112 billion of imports from China, with China retaliating. Um, there were some positive um, news uh, developments uh, in terms of, of China pulling back on some uh, new tariffs and uh, some, some favorable movements in terms of delay of the October 1 tranche to October 15th. Um, some exemptions put in place in, in China, the Chinese negotiators coming to D.C., and they were supposed to be talking with uh, farmers uh, today, but they actually canceled that and went back to, to China. So I'm not sure things are going that well in terms of the, the trade negotiations. Our baseline assumption remains uh, that we have essentially these tariffs in place, including the October 15th increase from 25% to 30% on $250 billion of imports from China um, being put in place on October 15th. Um, and that drag, the drag of the existing tariffs being worth about five-tenths on the U.S. economy, which is quite substantial in terms of the, the GDP growth drag. Uh, but talking about... Um, uncertainty, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty in the repo market over the last few days uh, with, uh, with the overnight rate surging, uh, with the effective federal funds rate um, going actually slightly above the upper bound. Um, what's going on in the repo market? Yeah, lots of plumbing problems yeah. in the financial markets is not good news, uh, as any plumbing problems are, can be problematic. And it actually overshadows really what the overall Fed policy is, is setting out to do, which is try to ease uh, rates lower. So um, what the Federal Reserve had to do was is revert back to something they did back in the, the financial crisis, 2008, and actually uh, inject uh, cash or reserves into the banking system. They did that through something called a repo operation, uh, and they've done multiple ones of those four days in a row, and they just uh, now are announcing that, you know, going forward over ye quarter end, they're going to do term repos, which is mm -hmm. multi-day and large ones overlapping. Uh, so that's all in the attempt to add reserves in the banking system. It, it looks as if the Fed has overdone it in terms of shrinking its balance sheet and the number of, and amount of reserves that are needed in the banking system to meet demand. Yep. Um, so they've now got to reverse gears. The other thing they uh, are probably going to do, uh, and it was mentioned by Chair Powell, is organically grow the balance sheet again. It's something we yes. highlighted uh, that is a quite a possibility. Now, a few weeks ago, months ago, we thought maybe they would wait until March of next year to start to grow the mm -hmm. balance sheet again. Now it looks like that could actually be happening at the next meeting, which is at the end of October. Um, and it could be quite substantial. They may have to boost um, the size of, of reserves, $250 billion just to get back to an equilibrium, and then grow the balance sheet on top of that to keep in line with other demands. So. We're still working through some of the numbers, but it could be something in the order of 400 billion uh, 
dollars worth of treasury debt has to be purchased to inject uh, liquidity into the system. Quite a and lot. Yeah. It's quite a lot. And then the last thing that uh, they could be considering is a uh, repo facility, sort of on demand. You could uh, swap treasury securities for bank reserves. This is a little technical, but the bottom line is since the crisis, there's been new regulations have been put in place, mm -hmm. more onerous on banks, yep. and they want to have reserves, which are the most liquid for them. And some of the regulations actually call for that. And so that what they're doing is they're hoarding reserves and not holding treasury securities. So therefore, there's that scarcity of reserves. So we'll be watching those developments uh, very closely. Now, I should note that an or organic growing of the balance sheet is not QE. It is not, yeah. But it may feel like it because <laughs> $400 billion is a lot. Um, so I think economists like us try to be very technical about this, and it's good to be so, but it's a lot. Um, and it's not fundamental. It should not be changing the trajectory, the fundamental trajectory of monetary policy, which is still accommodative, right? But it's like organic salad. You know, you can't tell the difference, but it might be better for your health. That's right. It may, it, 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 ultimately, it shows up eventually, fundamentally. Um, but then that kind of brings us to the question, too, what's actually, you know, it's not going to affect, it shouldn't affect economic activity unless the plumbing goes badly. Uh, but where do things stand uh, with the economy and the overall momentum right now? Well, I think the economy is in a good place. I think Powell stated it correctly, Clarida stated it correctly, that the economy is in a good place. Uh, if we look at the different components of the economy, um, they're doing relatively well. Now, we do have headwinds for exports. We do have headwinds for business investment. So we are in a slowing growth environment, but that by no means uh, indicates that there's an imminent downturn or recession around the corner. And Interestingly, the CD Economic Surprise Index actually rose to the highest level in three years. Now, some might take this as uh, saying this is a new dawn and the economy is about to, 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 to rebound very strongly. We would nuance that view. Just like on the downside, you have to be careful not to fall into the recession bias. On the upside, you have to be careful that this city surprise index is based on expectations. And if expectations are revised lower, then you're easily going to be surprised or more easily going to be surprised that's on the upside. Sort so. of like when stocks uh, outperform expectations have been beaten down already. That's, that's right. Uh, that's right. You have to be very earnings. careful with expectations uh, on that front. Um, I, I, just to come back to the Fed for a second, um, we've heard a, a lot with the Kekofo of speeches at the Fed, um, but we heard that Rosengren uh, dissented because he did not want to see another rate cut. Um, Bullard wanted two rate cuts, um, and Clarida seems to be leaning in the, sen in, in the camp of being in favor of perhaps one more rate cut. How, how do we explain all that, and where do you see the weight of the Fed being in terms of policy going into 2020? I think there's just great uncertainty. So there's uncertainty about the economic outlook. You have this divergence between domestic activity, global activity, global being weaker, uncertainty about trade policy, how that's going to affect and how that's going to play out. As you said, up until uh, recently, it looked like maybe there was a, tur a turn to the upside for trade policy and maybe some negotiation, and now that's been dampened. So I think in terms of uh, you know leadership, I would look at Clarida, I would look at Powell, and I would look at Williams, and Williams from the New York Fed, mm -hmm. uh, they're really the leaders, and I think they're kind of the leaders of this, uh, you know, the, the consensus of the Fed. Bullard, it's not surprising he would be a bit more, uh, want more accommodation. It's also not surprising Rosengren, who at one point was overseeing uh, the research and the uh, oversight of financial stability, is worried about financial yeah. instability if rates are too low. So, sure. you know, this is not a big surprise. Um, I think ultimately what's going to guide the Fed and, and the, the consensus at the Fed is where's the economy going? Yeah. What are the downside risks? Do they need to take out more insurance easing? And that ties into a lot of the work that we've been doing, right? What are the recession risks? Mm -hmm. what, what, what do we have to worry about? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think there are a number of worries on the horizon. We recently put out a note saying that there were eight reasons for concern, but none for panic. And I think that's really the, the right way to look at things. We have some signs that the economy is slowing. We have weaknesses in the business investment sector. We have weak profits and eroding profit margins. Uh, we have an environment in which uh, we see gradually slowing employment growth and employment intentions, um, yet disposable income growth remains fairly solid and people are still spending and feeling generally 
confident. As long as confidence holds up, I think we're in a, a relatively decent place in terms of that soft landing of the economy. Now, certainly recession risks are not zero. We put the recession odds for 2020 around 40%. That's relatively high, but that by no means indicate that there's a high likelihood of a recession. It just points to the fact that there are some concerns, and in particular, trade developments. Increased tariffs on consumer goods over the course of the next two or three months could have a more significant impact, direct impact on consumers, but also affect financial markets, affect financial conditions. And if the Fed is a bit slow to react, as we had in Q4, then that could amplify uh, that risk, especially in an environment where you have relatively elevated levels of corporate debt. So it is a picture worth monitoring very clo closely, but right now we're not in a state where we would call for recession, at least not an imminent recession. So with that, Kathy, I think uh, we've uh, kind of gone around the uh, U.S. economy. <laughs> and end on a little bit of a bright note, which is that's, that's good. <laughs> that's right. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll uh, redial back in uh, next month. Thanks very much.